Good evening, everyone, uh, and welcome to this session of the Online National Marxist School, sponsored by the Education Commission of CPUSA. My name is Duncan. I am the chair of the Asia Pacific Subcommittee of the Peace and Solidarity Commission. And I'll start with a brief introduction here. Tonight's class on China is entitled China from Feudal Dynasties and Century of Humiliation to Socialist Modernization. Tonight's class is in three parts. First, I will give a PowerPoint on some important points in Chinese history, especially those that have impact today. Second, we will hear from Emily, a Chinese American comrade who is currently working and studying in Beijing. She will present a PowerPoint on the People's Republic of China and socialist modernization. We hope you will join us for the last two classes this Saturday, June 10th, beginning at 11 a.m. That's Eastern time. After the presentations, there will be a question and answer session. Some information about me. I got interested in China as an anti-war activist in the 1960s. My first trip to China was with the U.S.-China People's Friendship Association in 1981. During the 1980s, I helped organize exchanges to and from China and served as editor of U.S.-China Review. This century, I coordinated the China Study Group at the Center for Marxist Education in Cambridge, and I last visited China in 2017. I've had articles published in People's World and Red World Review, as well as Portside and other places. I am eager to go back now that things are opening up after COVID. We want to approach the class with an open mind on a learning curve. Knowledge about China and Chinese civilization is not very good, either in the US general public or on the left. We have a lot to learn. There are different views on the vast country of China and that is understandable. Naturally, people have opinions, but be cautious about making judgments. Study the Chinese press as well as Western sources for balance and both sides of the story. So now let us start the PowerPoint. If you want to understand socialism with Chinese characteristics, you can start by knowing something about Chinese characteristics. That is a few basic facts about Chinese history and culture. This is essential. So what are uh, some Chinese characteristics? Now, let me say that these are my own interpretations as a Westerner who studied China in different ways over the last 50 years. The Chinese themselves would probably agree with some of these points of history, but also have a different take. Now our slide here, this is the Yellow Emperor. Uh, Chinese civilization is old, about 5,000 years, and is special in part due, its, due to its remarkable continuity. This enables a connection between the ancient and the modern. The mythological Yellow Emperor is a progenitor of the Chinese Han people, more of a person than a god. He brought many good things to the people, including the technologies of civilization. Almost as old as the Yellow Emperor is the book I Ching, in which the ancient Chinese seers and priests use the notation of yin and yang, broken in solid lines in their dialectical cosmology, their attempt to understand the world and divine the future. Leibniz, the 17th century German mathematician who developed binary mathematics, the basis of the digital revolution, observed that his notation of zero and one was the same as the ancient Chinese uh, broken and solid lines. Uh, this was a proto-scientific method, of course. The ancients didn't know modern scientific laws. But the point is that Chinese civilization has long shown great interest and in accomplishment in science and technology. So here's a kind of a comparison. This shows some historic Chinese innovations and in technology, some of the world's most important. On the right, you can see some uh, sectors where China is advancing today. Um, the People's uh, Government Resources, high-tech uh, development programs, not to take over the world for some nefarious goal, but simply returning to the traditional pursuits 
and China's place as one of the world's advanced civilizations. So here we have um, a picture of Confucius. Confucianism is focused on human relationships in the family and in society, and also on ethics. There is a 2,500 year old literature of humanism in China. While Confucianism's patriarchal values are outdated and must be discarded, current slogans such as people-centered development and shared future for humanity are concepts with deep roots in Chinese culture. China regards the success and poverty alleviation to be a major accomplishment in human rights. Keep China's humanist tradition in mind when discussing human rights. So now we're going to move on to the uh, to the dynasties. Um, China was um, unified by Qin Shi Huang, um, 221 BC. And the subsequent Han Dynasty, roughly concurrent with the Roman Empire, was similar in size and power. China at that time traded with Rome. Uh, the Qin Dynasty also standardized weights and measures, currency, and the legal system, built a great wall, and introduced a uniform script for writing. So when I when I was in school, uh, you know, in Ohio, I learned all about the Roman Empire, but they didn't tell me about the Qing Dynasty. And, and here we want to make the point that um, agriculture has been the basis of uh, the Chinese economy for the next 2,000 years. Um, and there were, China, of course, uh, also um, had very high quality um, commodities such as silk. These are women silk workers, um, porcelain and, and other goods very, very uh, desired in, uh, uh, in Europe and other places. And so you can, uh, China traded with Rome and here you can see this is a map of some of the roots of the, um, of the Silk Road, of the ancient Silk Road. It's interesting that um, many of these roots um, are the same as what's being developed today in, the, in terms of the infrastructure development, pipelines and so forth, and the Belt and Road Initiative. Um, so uh, for those of you interested in uh, reclaiming some women's history, you might want to study um, Wu Zetian, who was uh, one of the most important rulers of China. She was an empress during the Tang Dynasty for 30 or 40 years. She started as a 14-year-old concubine uh, sent to the imperial court for the um, pleasure of the emperor, um, and later she became empress and is generally regarded as one of the most successful and accomplished of the uh, China's rulers. And here you have the map of the Tang Dynasty. You can see um, on the left, that is, um, that's Xinjiang. So you can see that was part of, part of China at this time. Um, Buddhism also came into China, hundreds of millions of uh, practitioners. Uh, here you can see some of the architecture of, um, of the Tibetan Buddhists um, and also um, a, a mosque in Yangzhou. Uh, Genghis Khan conquered um, conquered China. The uh, Mongols conquered China. Kublai Khan hosted Marco Polo. You, know, you probably heard about that. Again, the Silk Road, very important at this time. Um, and this is, I find interesting in the early 15th century. These are the voyages of discovery of um, the early Ming Dynasty, which is about a generation ahead of the Portuguese. Uh, in terms of sailing to Africa. And the Chinese at this time also technologically very developed in terms of their, um, their long distance um, uh, uh, ships and so forth. Um, so the interesting thing to think about was th these long distance explorations were, were, were ended by decree of a later Ming emperor. What if they had continued? Um, world history might have been quite a bit different. And so now we're jumping over into the 18th century. Um, uh, and here you have the Qing Dynasty. And just to make the point, 1776, when Adam Smith wrote The Wealth of Nations, he cited China as one of the wealthiest places on earth. So that's 
where China was in 1776. However, that changed. Uh, as China uh, traded more and more with the West, um, Europe at that time imported large quantities of Chinese goods, but did not sell very much to China. There's a huge imbalance of trade. The British were very concerned that all their silver and gold was going to China. So they came up with opium um, as something they could import, well, export into China, addict to Chinese, um, balance the trade. But the Chinese uh, eventually declared opium uh, illegal. And so the British um, launched the opium war to force to take the um, uh, uh, Chinese um, were forced to import opium. And this was just the first of many of the colonial powers uh, invading China or uh, forcing concessions one way or another. Uh, this led to a um, one reason for a huge civil war, which you don't hear much about, roughly contemporary to the US civil war, only it was longer, much bigger and much bloodier. Uh, and it had a sort of democratic aspect of rising up against the um, of the Qing, they called the Taiping Rebellion. Uh, switching over to the U.S., you can see at this time is when uh, Chinese immigrants came and helped build the um, Transcontinental Railway, among other things, the mines and so forth. However, they were eventually unwelcomed, um, and the, the Chinese Exclusion Act. Uh, 1882, and there was a lot of racism and um, lynchings and so forth. That's a very important part of history that's uh, not talked about that much. Japanese invaded uh, in 1890s, defeated China, and next Taiwan. Um, later on, there was a major Japanese fascist invasion in the 1930s and 1940s. Some 20 million Chinese lost their lives fighting fascism. Uh, we jump to, let's see, you go to the revolution of 1911. The workers rose up and overthrew the Qing dynasty and established what proved to be a rather, at first, weak republic. Um, but the dynasties were ended, 1911, by the working class. Uh, this is an interesting kind of contemporary uh, picture of a women's uh, military unit attacking uh, the imperial forces. And other interesting women in the Chinese Revolution, Chu Jin was a martyr, early feminist, Sung Ching Ling, influential supporter of many revolutionary causes. She, she was the wife of Sun Yat-sen, leader of the 1911 revolution. She was, I consider her an early founder of the People's Friendship Movement. In 1919, the Versailles Treaty, discriminated against China, handed um, Germany's concessions over to Japan, even though China fought with the Allies. Uh, this caused a major um, protest in China, and May 4th movement, it's called um, anti-imperialist, major anti-imperialist movement, calling for a revolution in culture, modern science, modern democracy, and so forth. And here, you, this was a, in many ways a student-led movement, here, the students are welcoming a victory. And uh, the Russian Revolution shortly thereafter impacted uh, China, and China founded the Communist Party. There's only about 15, 16 people in the original, um, in the original meeting in Shanghai, including Mao, of course. But the, the party did very well. It was growing very rapidly, so the reactionaries double-crossed the Communist Party in 1927 and launched a, a tremendously brutal massacre of all uh, party members and leftists and uh, trade unions and feminists, et cetera, they could find. It's almost destroyed the party, embarked on the Long March, which is a big strategic retreat to the uh, safe areas in the Northwest. Uh, there's a lot of sort of romantic kind of stories about the Long March, which are certainly deserved. It's a, an amazing um, saga. 
but we should also see that for many of the marchers, it was grueling and actually majority of the long marchers never made it. They were either killed, died, uh, left, whatever. But the long march established, um, helped establish the um, base areas uh, in Yan'an and Northwest China. Um, and um, here's where um, I think a lot of ways where socialism with Chinese characteristics, what was first really developed and elaborated. And here you can, there was a major forum literature of art that was held in Yan'an. And at this time, uh, the US and China were allies during World War II fighting the, the Japanese fascists. And there was a lot of collaboration between the US and China at that time, and particularly also the, the US and the Communist Party um, led Red Army, uh, that um, US military um, were dispatched to China. And you can see some of them talking to Mao. There are a lot of friendships and good feelings were built up at this time when the US and China are allies, and China today is trying to reach back to these roots and the Friendship Association. Uh, is trying to reach back to these roots to improve um, improve relations. Here you can see the Civil War. Um, those red areas in the north, that's the uh, Red Army uh, area. Moving south, eventually uh, Mao's armies, Judah's armies, uh, won throughout China and Chiang Kai-shek and the reactionary Guomindang retreated to Taiwan, which is that green island you can see in southeast part of China. And on October 1st, 1949, here you have Chairman Mao proclaiming the establishment of the People's, People's Republic of China. Shortly thereafter, the Korean War broke out. Um, US and China became enemies. Um, hidden history of the Korean War is just, there's just been an updated version of this book put out, which gives you a much more objective account of what actually uh, happened during the Korean War, as opposed to the propaganda that one learns in school, or at least in most schools. Um, and this, at this time, this is when the, the US sent its seventh naval fleet into the Taiwan Strait to protect Chiang Kai-shek's anti-communist government on Taiwan. And this is the beginning, that act is the beginning of the whole Taiwan issue. There's no such thing as, you know, independent Taiwan or anything like that prior to this action by U.S. imperialism. So you have, of course, um, the Yellow Peril in the 1950s, the McCarthy period, Ch Chinese spies everywhere, um, Cold War repression. And unfortunately, with the revival of Cold War today, by the U.S. and its allies, you can see the return of some of the some of this racist type uh, um, stereotyping and anti-China feeling. Now, Zhou Enlai, upon founding the People's Republic of China, um, uh, envisioned a modern socialist China, uh, a peaceful coexistence, anti-war, and and particularly working with the countries of what they called the non-aligned movement at that time, the, the ex-colonies, the newly independent countries of Africa, Asia and Latin America, um, was also a focus of, of, of Chinese policy in the 1950s, along with working with the Soviet Union. And here you can see um, the rapprochement with, uh, with the US in 1971, 72, that period. So what are some lessons of history? China was a self-described semi-colonial, semi-feudal country in 1949. That is, the production forces were mostly backward, agricultural, agriculture mostly using feudal technology. So it's important to understand that the People's Republic became, began socialist construction in a country largely impoverished, poor, and undeveloped. China has this in common with many ex-colonies in developing countries in the third world or global south. 
China's program for advanced science and technology is not for world hegemony or to dominate the U.S. Rather, from the time of the Yellow Emperor, uh, Chinese culture and civilization has always been very interested in and in, in pushing technological in, uh, innovation. Um, so, you know, my feeling is that China will match the West in most areas of science and technology. The West may retain dominance in some sectors, but China almost certainly pushed beyond the West in other areas and set the world standard. And this is what imperialism uh, is most afraid of. So the US should not be uh, trying to block China's rise. It's not gonna work. Um, you can throw down some obstacles in front of you know Huawei and TikTok uh, and so forth, but uh, uh, that's not gonna stop the uh, huge trend of, of China modernizing. So we should be cooperating. Uh, for mutual benefit, for peace, um, you know, for for dealing with climate change, pandemics, and so forth. So, if we had time or some other point, we can talk about some of the actions I, um, that um, we can take. So, here's my final slide: serve the people. That that's uh, summarizes a lot about uh, socialist China. So, thank you for listening. And I now want to turn things over to Emily, who's going to deal with um, a different uh, history and issues concerning the socialist construction in the People's Republic. Um, you can speak, Emily. Uh, is my slides showing? Yes, yes. Okay. Well, uh, thank you, Duncan. Um, it is a great honor for me as a Chinese American to be here to talk about the history of the land of my ancestors. Uh, my name is Emily, and I'm a member of the CPUSA's Peace and Solidarity Commission. I currently work in Beijing as a biologist. I was born in the US, but I spent part of my childhood in China, I took a major part of my education there as well. So I reckon I have a pretty good access to the history of the CDC and New China from a different perspective than most, especially recent history, which is part of my lived experience. So today I will go over the modern part of Chinese history, but particularly how the CDC built it and modernized socialist New China after its founding. So particularly, I want to illustrate how did China go from a major agricultural and uh, developed, backwardly developed country from here to here in a matter of 70-ish years. I hope by illustrating the process of China's modernization, I could show that it is possible for the working class everywhere to achieve such transformations and that we could learn from China and work alongside China for a better reality. So here will be the structure of my talk today. I will break down the history post 1949 to four parts. First, the founding of the PRC and the socialist system. Second, the socialist development, the explorations and the setbacks. And third, the socialist with Chinese characteristics that we know of, uh, the SWCC. And finally, I will talk about the SWCC in the new era, which is uh, now our time. So let's turn our time back to October 1949. The revolution is won. The CBC kicked the KMT out of most parts of China, save a few. The Mao Zedong stood on the Tiananmen Square, stood on the building, pressed the big communism button, and announced that the Chinese people have stood up. New China is here. But now what? Let's take a look at the shambles China was in back then. So of course, first of all, not all parts of China have been liberated back then, notably Xinjiang, Tibet's part of the South, and don't forget the island of Taiwan. And speaking of Taiwan, sure, the Kuomintang left, but in its last years of rule in the mainland, it basically screwed up the economy so bad, created huge inflations, and when they fled to Taiwan, they took most of the gold reserve of China with them. The productive forces shriveled because of years of wars and economic turmoil, and the market was filled with inflation and rampant speculation. 
And aside from that, China didn't have much else left either. The infrastructure was also wrecked by war, development was halted, and the, that is a lasting result of the hundred years of shame. And while the working people embrace socialism wholeheartedly, the remnants of the old social order still dwell in all corners of the society. And on the outside, there was danger as well. The US made allies with the Kuomintang on Taiwan, trying to launch a counterattack to take over the mainland again. The US and the UN army was also threatening China in the north with their intervention in Korea. So it's, a, it's basically a dangerous time all around. CPC has to not only finish the liberation, but also build a socialist system, not just in name, but in all aspects from the ground up that can sustain and defend itself. So uh, let's think about the whole uh, socialist modernization as a long quest in, in a game or something, uh, but it has to be uh, divided into little quest objective. And the quest objective at this time is very clear. First, we need to make a socialist system from ground zero. In order to do that, the country must first have a socialist political system that includes the legislative bodies, the different levels of government from central to local, and changing the old laws that reflect feudal and capitalist interests into new ones that reflect progressive working class values. So that's what the CDC did. On its way to liberate places like Xinjiang and Tibet, they did their best to earn the trust of the indigenous people. There were also stories of CPC cadres who went to the indigenous tribes in Yunnan and had to did blood oaths with them to earn their trust. The CPC solved the national question of the uh, ethnic minorities by establishing different levels of autonomous regions, autonomous counties, and so on, and make sure that indigenous people rule these districts in majority. For legislative bodies, the CPC established the People's Congress and they continue to meet to this day. Uh, the CPC also established a series of progressive laws, the first being marriage law, which worked to uproot feudal practices that oppress vulnerable populations for hundreds, if not thousands of years, which is a huge undertaking. In order to counter external pressure, China worked on two fronts. First, to combat imperialist advances, the Chinese People's Volunteer Army went into Korea and fought valiantly, earning the ceasefire in Korea that is to, there today. It also worked on peace and solidarity with the so-called Third World, as Duncan had just mentioned, especially with the newly liberated Asian and African countries, countries in the Latin America, and so on. China supported the self-determination of indigenous nations and came up with the five principles of peaceful coexistence. These principles continue to guide China's diplomatic works to this day. And of course, uh, being a materialist, we know that a country should also have a working economic system in order to sustain and develop. In China's case, this also includes the brand new task of making a socialist economy. So the first step, as we might imagine, is to confiscate the capital of bureaucrat capitalists and turn them into state assets. However, this is not as simple as you know, taking all the capitalists, put them to, to the wall once the big communist button is pressed. There were many progressive capitalists who supported the new democratic revolution. And these people's capital were turned into public-private joint businesses through negotiations. So all of these are part of the Marxist and Leninist uh, transformation of the national economy. The CBC's econo economists also work to stabilize prices, fight against speculations, and unify state financial and economic works. All of these were in line with the Marxist-Leninist view of socialist economy, and we can find many similarities to Lenin's economic plans as well. So as I mentioned, China's productive forces were very, very underdeveloped. So the CBC established a series of plans in five-year units. So these five-year plans continue to be implemented and completed to this day uh, with a couple of years of halt in between, but uh, there have been like several, you know, there have been a dozens of five-year plans. The first five-year plans officially launched the process of socialist industrialization, focusing on what China didn't really have then, which is heavy industry. So in this first, very first five-year period, China was able to make their first cars on their own and build a lot of infrastructures such as roads and bridges, even in places with, with very bad natural environments such as um, the Qinghai Tibet uh, road. At the time, 
China's economic system was using Mao's own words, state capitalism. <laughs> That's right, he used that phrase. But although he used that in Lenin's sense, which is the state will place orders on private enterprises and the private enterprises were not allowed to freely expand their capital and market share. Uh, also, the CDC expanded joint public-private operations of enterprises and the small handicraft productions were put into cooperatives as well. And agricultures are on, on the front of agriculture, there were the agricultural cooperative movement. So by the year of 1946, these so-called beginners quests were declared complete and new China was officially transformed into a social state. Uh, here are some pictures uh, depicting events from that era. You can see this is the first car made in the PRC. This is the Qinghai Tibet Highway, which is filled in like snowy plateau. And Zhou Enlai, the Bandung Conference, and this is the meeting of the first National People's Congress. So now China has transformed into a socialist state, but it still needs to grow. And this is usually when an already existing socialist country run into some difficulties because each country starts with a different hands of cards, so to speak. One must evaluate their own situations and, and adapt Marxism-Leninism based on their own situation. And this also marks the so-called classical Mao era. So the CBC, of course, studied itself and what its major pressure point is the concept of principal contradiction was lifted from Mar Marxism Leninism, but here in the context of China, it is slightly different, more material and concrete, you could say. It means that the principal conflict pressure point between two opposing forces or factors that hang over the nation and the masses. So before 1949, the principal contradiction was that between imperialism and the Chinese nation, and that between feudalism and the oppressed masses. Now, at the turn of 1956, the CDC determined that the principal contradictions are, one, the contradiction between underdeveloped agricultural countries and developed industrial countries, two, the contradiction between the people's growing material and cultural need and underdeveloped social production. Do remember this last part of the sentence because we will encounter it later. So, now when we think of the classical Mao era, for good or bad, we might think about this. However, this is also a time of remarkable development in industry, technology, and science. Well, with a big dose of that as well. So what essentially happened in this era was that after some practices, the CPC, who once was following the Soviet uh, recipe of socialism, they determined that the Soviet past, particularly the economic model, did not suit China's condition very well, so that China must seek its own path towards a great socialist industrialized country. The key idea here is that there is no one size fits all solution to socialist modernization because each country have a different material basis. Notice that this is also the essence of the socialists with Chinese characteristics to come. This is a, a long standing tradition in the CPC. Remember, as I said, the CPC functions in continuums. Uh, there is no huge cutoffs between the leaderships. They all follow the same Chinese uh, communist tradition. So naturally, because the CBC is figuring out its own way, this led to some setbacks. The Great Leap Forward and the Cultural Revolution were both attempts to carve out a Chinese way to modernize and develop socialism faster, either on the material front or on the ideological front. But they fell on idealism and they failed. And uh, the CBC admits that in their own words. But besides that, the CPC also led China to a great deal of accomplishments during this time. When people talk about the Mao era, they tend to focus on the flashy events for good or bad. But we as communists, we should look at things materially and comprehensively. So what are those? In fact, one of the key strategies that carried on even into the 80s was formally introduced during this time, which is the four modernizations. The four modernizations was brought up by Mao Zedong in the 50s, and it was introduced by Zhou Enlai to the National Congress in 1964. This strategy pointed out where China should focus on developing. As the rehabilitation of economy has been done in 56, this corresponds to the principal contradiction between the underdeveloped agricultural countries and the developed industrial countries. 
So the idea in its original form was phased out after a few decades as China already is somewhat modernized, but the emphasis of, on development of socialism would be present and develop and expand expanded in all common strategies. So uh, the four modernizations are industry, agriculture, science and technology, and natural defense. So let's look at what accomplishments China achieved during this time on these modernizations. So first, I must dispel a lie that has been promoted by counter-revolutionaries a lot. Socialism is not tied to famine. Sure, in the early 50s, there have been a series of natural disasters and China experienced some famines in some places, but after this one time, one time, China achieved food security despite being under double sanctions from both the Eastern and the Western bloc. On industry, China developed a lot of technologies, for example, nukes and the artificial satellite, which greatly dispelled the nuclear threats from imperialist powers. China also seeks to expand its energy security by discovering and developing oil fields in Daqing. And in education and science, Chinese scientists successfully synthesized bovine insulin, which is a world first. They could have even claimed a Nobel Prize, but because the Nobel Prize was given to a few individuals, but this is a collective effort, not an individual one, so they didn't even participate. And illiteracy, which was very common in rural China in poor areas, was being steadily eliminated. This is no easy task. Look at how hard the Chinese language is. Healthcare was also greatly developed during this time as healthcare was made more accessible in, in rural areas. Hygiene and epidemic prevention were also an emphasis. This was originally introduced as a national movement to combat imperialist threats of biowarfare, which was heightened during the Korean War, and the spirit continued into this era. So now we can see that despite some setbacks, socialist China was still developing and achieved a lot during this turbulent time. This is because of CPC's leadership, not despite of it. But now we must also admit that at the turn of the late 70s, early 80s, China was kind of closed off and could have developed faster. This led to a great realization of the CPC that the, and the more familiar so-called Deng era and the formal introduction of the socialists with Chinese characteristics. And is to some, it is like a more familiar history as well. So in 1981, the CPC identified that the primary contradiction of the time as the contradiction between the people's growing material need and cultural needs and the underdeveloped social production. At the time, while China can sustain itself in agriculture and light industry, the quality of life is generally lacking. The social, total social production is also lagging behind. Well, to put it bluntly, compared to other countries, especially the more developed countries, China's social production was like a cupcake compared to an eight inch cake. Um, no matter how fair you distribute a cupcake, it's still just a cupcake and no one is truly satisfied. So this kind of socialism doesn't seem too greatly advantageous compared to capitalism, even when capitalist societies are wracked with oppression and unjust distribution. It's just hard to combat capitalism when you don't have material advantages over capitalism. And as Deng famously, famously said, poverty should not be a quality of socialism. China wanted a well-developed socialism, a socialism that has advantages over capitalism. In order to do that, China must make the proverb proverbial cake bigger and is very urgent. Such a change in course after the 10 years of chaos would national, naturally lead to a lot of ideological confusions. Some people might even try to co-opt this change or try to destroy China's revolutionary legacy and dissolve the socialist leadership and so on. The CPC foresaw that and made special effort to emphasize that they must keep to the socialist role. What people don't usually discuss is that a lot of ideological struggles happened during that time. And in the end, it was concentrated into four cardinal principles, which are keeping to the socialist ideology and politics, upholding the dictatorship of the proletarians, upholding the leadership of the CBC, and upholding Marxism, Leninism, and the Mao Zedong thought. Also, the public sector economy was determined that, that must be maintained as the majority, but although diverse forms of economy are also encouraged. So with that as the basis, the goal was clear. China must develop social production and quickly as well. 
In order to not make huge mistakes again, the CPC began to do small scale trials in a few places before implementing strategies nationwide. This is true for both the agricultural reform and opening up, opening up markets. Places like Shenzhen and Hainan are established as special zones where open trade are being tested, then gradually introduced to the rest of the country. Private and collective businesses were encouraged to be established. Foreign investments were allowed to happen, although foreign investment has to be like a joint investment with a Chinese business and laws must be abide by yada yada. All of these measures greatly increased the overall incentive to develop social production. And the result is kind of well-known history. On the cultural front, more diverse expression was encouraged and a lot of foreign arts and movies were imported. Local art, music, and literature flourished, entertainment industries advanced, and all of that. But well, with the you know, with the opening up of market naturally come the establishing of foreign relations. This also includes repairing relations with the Eastern Bloc countries as well. And of course, you know, uh, establishing a relation with the US and the West. Also, since opening up the market naturally means getting exposed to foreign, especially bourgeois liberal influences, the imperialists saw that and tried to instigate some color revolutions in order to overthrow the CPC like they did the USSR. The CPC had to thwart a few color revolution attempts, which they did successfully. Etc. So some of these pictures are really heartwarming to see because a lot of them happened during my lifetime, which may be some of your lifetimes as well. You know, Deng Xiaoping writing on the success of, of Shenzhen, China joining the WTO, you know, Hong Kong returns, uh, Macau returns as well, Beijing Olympics, which continues to marvel people today. Those are all of the pretty well-known accomplishments of China back then. So I will not draw on the so-called past 40 years for too much because, well, that is pretty well known. Instead, I want to spend a bit more time on what China today is focusing on, how they plan to move forward, which we are in our current movement. So let's fast forward to 2017. In the 19th National Congress of the CPC, they identified the principal contradiction of the time as the contradiction between the people's growing material and cultural needs and the uneven and unthorough development of social production. Note the change from underdeveloped to uneven and unthorough development. So the proverbial cake is big enough now. The CBC recognized that it is time to divide, to divide the cake in a better way. So see, the CBC knows full well that with market and allowing capitalist economy to happen in China, it comes with drawbacks and they're focusing on dealing with it. These drawbacks have part of its roots in China's long feudal history and remnants of the hundreds years of shame. When the market is opened up and capital is allowed to exist, the remnants of feudalism, bureaucrat capitalism and colonialism, the so-called three big mountains, also got a little bit of a breather and they banded together to try and get more interest for, the, for their own. And since China is in a global market right now, also inevitably the imperialist West that dominated this market tried to enforce its own design on China. They want China to stay as a world factory on the lower end of the global production chain, which China doesn't, does not want to be. And when they realize that China doesn't want to stay like that, nor could they overthrow China through color revolution, they began to use force with their blockade, payment efforts, and threats of war, which leads to the so-called Cold War 2.0 that we are experiencing today. All of these are challenges China is tackling. Now, just last year, we saw the CDC's 20th National Congress, which, well, which fully detailed their recent work and near future plans for a better socialist China. This includes uh, achieving small common prosperity, which include uh, in eliminating poverty, uh, concerted efforts on all fronts of social development, which in, includes uh, institu institutional reforms, socialist ideology, uh, democracy, self-government of the party, etc. Uh, overcoming key obstacles in industry and technology to thwart the imperialist stress and combating imperialist stress through rejuvenating the people's military forces and building foreign relations promoting international trade, promoting global peace, and so on. 
Now let's talk about some of these uh, focuses in detail. These are aspects that I think we as Western comrades could really learn from China's experience or cooperate with China on. So starting from 2015, the CBC began to tackle one of the hardest remnants of underdevelopment, the last bastion of poverty, which are poor counties that have such suboptimal conditions that it's hard for them to have any motivation to modernize. We all know backwater places like that. They occur all over the world and in the United States as well. So to combat poverty in these places, the CBC sent cadres and experts to these counties to help with local governance, developing economic strategies, introducing technologies, encouraging education, et cetera, et cetera. Many of them dedicated their prime years to these places. Some even lost their lives. Picture here on the bottom right is a young comrade who worked very hard in her county as a CPC cadre, and she lost her life due to a car accident on her commute to the village, and she is recognized as a martyr. Uh, very recently, there is a biopic made about her. What is special about this new wave of poverty alleviation measures is that it is both targeted and concerted. The state allocated resources and design strategies for these places according to each, re each region's conditions and needs. And all possible sectors of the society, from the government to local businesses, even to the military, contributed, contributed to lifting these, poverty, uh, these counties out of poverty. For example, the expert would study the region and figure out what economic crops are best fit to grow there, you know, such as fruits or nuts. The Congress would help the local government to roll the plan out, persuade the people to cooperate, persuade the people to send their kids to school, etc. Agronomy experts will teach the people how to grow things better. Local businesses will try to promote and buy these products. Uh, more, develop, more developed provinces, you know, such as Jiangsu and Shanghai, uh, will direct resources to underdeveloped provinces. And uh, the PLA may even help with infrastructures, disaster relief, and day-to-day -day life problems. So it's like a whole concerted effort. As a Chinese saying goes, uh, the whole nation is a game of chess, so everyone must ha uh, everything must happen concertedly. So by February 25th, uh, 2011, uh, so, sorry, 20, 2021, it was declared that all 832 poor counties were lifted out of abject poverty. This is something unprecedented in the thousands of years of Chinese history. And of course, with the heightened global situation, China is doing their part to save the collective humanity from capitalist destruction as well. So you've probably heard about the Belt and Road Initiative. It is called a initiative because it is not coercive. Everyone must be willing to join. So it, uh, through this initiative, China was able to introduce their modernization experiences, such as building infrastructures, providing medical care and education to developing countries that are willing to modernize as China do. And saving the humanity isn't limited on human beings as well. China is leading in green technologies, such as wind and solar power, uh, and you know the electric cars as well and is one of the leading countries in reforestation, the other being India. So look at that. We, uh, you know, as people in the developing, developed countries, uh, we can certainly do better. Politically, the CBC is also becoming more proactive internationally as the threat of imperialism and a new Cold War grows. They are more active in SolidNet now, and also initiated many meetings, workshops, and programs to communicate with international comrades. Just this March, the CPC brought forth one of its global initiatives, the Global Civilization Initiative, during a high-level meeting of global political parties, which the CPUSA also attended. Uh, the global initiatives are Global Development Initiative, Global Security Initiative, and the Global Civilization Initiatives. These initiatives promote the value of mutual respect, peace, communication, and common prosperity. And uh, look here, this is uh, one of our co-chairs, uh, Kamer Rosanna, in a CPC workshop in Beijing. So now we're finally at the end of today's presentation. What I hope to be the take-home message is that the significance of Socialist China's quest for us is in the spirit of understanding our own characteristics. 
Adapting socialism to each society's characteristics is innate to dialectical materialism and is innate to all successful, successful practices of existing socialist countries. Contradictions and main objectives will shift with time and place as well. So we as international comrades should also not be stagnant or idealistic. We should study our own characteristics and determine our own roles towards socialism and prosperity. We should also be steadfast in Marxism. As Xi Jinping said in the 20th National Congress, and I roughly translated, the CPC can, the SWCC is good. It's all because Marxism is good. Marxism works. And because the CPC stick to its promises, we can also look forward to China's future contents and what we can learn from them. Because by 2030, by 2035, they'll complete the quest line of basic socialist modernization. And hopefully we could all live to see the beautiful year of 2050, which when China will become a truly awesome uh, modern socialist power as they uh, have planned, it will be strong, democratic, civilized, harmonious, and beautiful. So uh, these are my references. I try to use uh, CPC literature uh, to, you know, to be scientific. Thank you again for being here, and may we all convene in a beautiful socialist future for all mankind. <laughs> and now we're ready for questions and comments, please. Thank you, Emily and Duncan, very much for your presentation. Uh, hello, everyone. This is Molly. I am today's moderator for the discussion. If you would like to introduce a question or a comment, please raise your hand by clicking the icon of the hand and then click the icon of the mic to open your mic. After that, I will call on your name and I will open the mic on our end. So for now, I am looking for raised hands. Again, if you would like to introduce a question or comment, please click the image of the hand to raise your hand. Mohsin Sadiq, your mic is open on our end. Please open your mic on your end. There you go. Thank you very much. Um, my, my name is Mohsin Sadiq. I will the, the party club in Washington, D.C. The, the development in China and it's been given an example of what happened to the socialist movement in, in to the, you remember between, between in the, the china and india posed a very important challenge to marxism at one point and there was a big, big discussion between uh, mn Roy of india and uh, Lenin on the question of the path of development because both china and india communist party wanted to sort of avoid the the stage-wide development of history of, of society that marx only talks about Go, go, to, go to bourgeois democratic changes and the socialism. And this had a little repercussion in the, in the speed that developed between the Soviet Union and, the, and the China, and that caused a lot of harm to the, to the social movement. But I mean, finally, China essentially has gone back to the, uh, to the, 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 the uh, nature of development that uh, Marxism talks about. I mean, we see that Vietnam has adopted the same thing. And I think China has corrected those and has, has gotten the path of development that they need to, need to develop the, the productive forces before you can uh, do stock of socialism. So I think the development in China is very good. Uh, but the one thing that concerns me is that uh, in, the, in the matter of the environment, for example, China has, is doing a lot of stuff in terms of developing new uh, energy sources. But one thing is not we don't see that we are not we can't treat the earth as a as a infinite source of resources because resource develop the depletion is a major problem and the the kind of the 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 bourgeoisie the, the kind of uh, we'll see, of quality please, of living, uh, wrap up your question thank you right that that cannot cannot be sustained and I think China could take a leadership in changing the the, 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 the name, the kind of the life that we want for ourselves and not based on consumerism and uh, expulsion of the, of the art that will leave nothing for the future generation. That's my comment. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you. Elliot, your uh, mic is open on our end. Please open your mic on your end. Hello. 
There Can you, you hear me? Yes. So I was just wondering, uh, do you think modern China has strayed away from its socialist roots? I apologize if this is a dumb question. I don't really know much about Chinese history or, but I think I don't know much about modern China is what I'm trying to say. Thank you for this, by the way. This is an amazing webinar. Thank you so much for this. I, I like it. Thank you. David, your mic is open on our end. Please open your mic on yours. Dave, there you go. Hi, yes, thank you. Um, coming from um, a person whose parents are both half Vietnamese, half Chinese, I was curious, um, and sorry if I missed any, if it was presented earlier in the presentation, but I was curious if there's any resources um, I can explore around the um, splits that were occurring with like China and the Soviet and China and Vietnam during that time right off the bat. Um, I know that, um, you know, past decade or two, uh, Vietnam and China have, you know, rebuilt um, friendly, uh, comradely relations and whatnot, but I'm curious if there's any resources for me to explore on that topic. Thank you. Thank you, David. And we'll take one more for now and we'll open the floor again. Giancarlo, your mic is open. Uh, please open your mic. There you go. Okay, uh, thank you. Um, first, I, I want to thank uh, both Duncan and Emily uh, just briefly for a great presentation. My question is, um, you know, China for the last several decades has been uh, has very much maintained an attitude of non-interference in the internal affairs of other countries. In contrast to, I would say, um, say East Germany and Cuba uh, participating in Angola and Namibian struggles for independence, uh, and to some degree that might have been a function of uh, their position in the world. So. Is there any feeling that they might become um, more proactive in lending assistance to revolutionary movements outside of China now that they are more preeminent in the world? Or is it very much part of the character of the state uh, to abstain from doing that? Thank you. All right, I'll turn it over to Duncan and Emily. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Um, Emily, would you like to uh, say something about whether um, modern China has strayed from its uh, socialist roots? All right. Uh, yeah, I'm. I, I will consider myself pretty prepared on that front. So, as I uh, as I just said in the seminar, uh, that China's plan, uh, step by step, are all following the principles of Marx, Marxism, Leninism, and following dialectical materialism and uh, stick to um, their way of development by applying the principles of Marxism Leninism to the characteristics of China. So, so I would say China is still socialist and they're following the socialist um, principle of developing uh, social production. Uh, for, uh, and I think for that you can go, uh, you can look up some of the references that I mentioned that uh, the CBC has been upholding Marxism, Leninism all throughout. The, the way that they're doing it might uh, superficially look like very different from past socialist practices of other countries, but in principle, they're still Marxist, Leninist. So I will say China is still socialist. And I want to kind of comment on the four, fourth question, which is, um, China being non-interference uh, in the affairs of other nations, and maybe uh, do they plan on lending a hand to uh, to global revolutionary efforts? I think I have written about this before, which is that China's uh, China's way of uh, handling socialist modernization is to lift the masses out of their material contradictions in a scientific and sustainable way. 
And in this day and age, most countries have their economy and industry highly reliant on a globalized system that is dominated by the United States. So even if a country can succeed in their socialist revolution and break free from the clutch of imperialist control, can this economy stand on its own sustain sustainably? Will it be industrialized enough to you know, sustain itself and withstand the waves of blockades and aggression from the imperialists? So even if it can, the cost will be very high and all already existing socialist countries knows it best as every single one of them has withstood it for many years. So maybe if for China, it considered it's not wise to export revolution just to prove a moral point to the more uh, global left. Uh, it's not dialectical, but this to do so. Not even mentioning that as a ruling party of a major power, the CDC also have other obligations on the global states that it fulfill through the Chinese government. So it is not good to meddle with the internal revolutions like that. And this is against the principle of Chinese uh, diplomatic strategies and the principle of non-interference and the spirit of self-determination as well. So in order for a country to materialistically be, be able to break free from the system of imperialist exploitation on its own and to walk towards socialism sustainably, the country must first establish its economy to be more well-rounded. And this, I would dare to say that this is what the BRI, the Belt and Road Initiative, is trying to do. So this is China's current way of so-called exporting revolution, which is a revolution of the means of production. And I think it will benefit the world in the long run. Well, I, I would just make a couple of comments. You know, somebody says, well, has China abandoned its socialist roots? Well, I would, I would argue to the contrary. China is finding and implementing its socialist roots. Um, it's very important to understand that in 1949, China was a semi-colonial, semi-feudal country. That's the Chinese phrase, which they will repeat again and again, semi-colonial, semi-feudal. Um, semi-colonial, um, China was um, in invaded and suffered hugely, just in terms of number of deaths, 30 million, how many? from the colonial imperialist inv invasions and attacks. Um, and partly because of that, because of the tremendous damage done to China, China's um, production was a semi-feudal, you might say it was 80% feudal economy in 1949, but with some capitalism, you know, in places like Shanghai or Wuhan. But China is not building socialism uh, on the basis of a developed capitalist economy which is what was originally kind of envisioned by Marx and Engels. And so it had, it had to develop those production forces um, quickly. Those forces, um, heavy industry and so forth, which were developed by capitalism, and it had to do it at a time when the, when the world is still mostly capitalist and imperialism is intent on wiping out China. So uh, that was its choice to in, incorporate a capitalist sector, to expand that sector in the 1980s and 1990s in order to rapidly develop, which is um, the, the Chinese felt was the best choice in the situation that they were in. Economically, it worked very well. Today, China is shifting back to its socialist roots. You go to China today and they talk a whole lot about, about Marxism, about socialist core values, about Marxist education, and you'll find business uh, to be heavily, uh, more heavily regulated. So um, I, that's socialism with Chinese characteristics. And it's gonna look very different in a country that, that is the victim of imperialism than, than it will in a developed country, let's say like the United States. Now, as far as the Sino-Soviet split, um, the only thing I know about that is based on documents at the time, which I've read. And that's a, um, I think that question may go a bit beyond the uh, scope of this uh, this particular class uh, could be directed towards the um, 
there are classes on Marxism and on the history of Marxism, perhaps directed, um, better directed toward the people, right? You know, uh, the leaders of those classes. So I guess that's... I, I, wanted to, I wanted to add that if you, the, after the uh, uh, Vietnamese Chinese comrade, uh, if you want to learn about the that part of history, it is better to uh, find documents of, from both ends of, uh, from, from both ends of the split. And it is, I guess, for, a, for an American comrade, it is not, I don't feel very appropriate to comment on that, uh, except for encouraging you to find uh, official documents, especially when, you know, the imperialist at home would benefit the most from our disunity. Uh, well, yeah, as you said, uh, the CBC and CPV and also the Russian Communist Party as well, they are all on very good terms with the CBC as well, and we should hope it stay that way. Uh, so a, a lot of the conflicts might have the uh, uh, might be rooted in their you know ideological difference in what is good uh, for socialism as you know each country develop their characteristics and you know issues on non, non interference but you know just uh, a general principle is to look at documents from both sides. Okay, thank you both. And we will open the floor for more questions and comments. As a reminder, if you would like to introduce a question, please indicate that by clicking the icon of the hand to raise your hand and then clicking the icon of the mic to open your mic. I will then call on your name and open your mic on our end. Keenan, your mic is open. Keenan. Sorry about that. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Um, okay. I just, um, I apologize if this seems like repeating an earlier question, but I thought that it was, and I think I feel like it's an important question that gets brought up a lot um, in a lot of discussions, especially online. Um, just to maybe narrow the question down to, I think, what's the important bit is that I think that a lot of us, um, and this could, of course, just be the way that we see it from our Western perspective, and especially with, through our media and history. Um, a lot of us see that in like, between especially the 1970s and 1980s, it looks like there was a worldwide uh, capitulation to uh, Western liberal uh, economics across the world, including the Soviet Union, uh, maybe Vietnam, um, and China. And I think that's the reason why people ask um, whether or not these countries have strayed from their socialist roots. So uh, I was wondering, maybe you have a comment, uh, any of you guys have a comment, particularly on perhaps how that period of time is um, analyzed internally in China or other nations that commented on it. Thank you, Keenan. Monzia, your mic is open. Please open the mic on your end. Monzia, your mic is open. There you go. Hi, uh, Molly, it's Mazaya. Uh, thank you for the presentation and the responses to the questions. Uh, one of the questions I had is, um, what, how is one to describe China? Would you say that China is a deformed worker state? Um, or a socialist state, um, and uh, if you answer for for either, if it is a socialist state, could you uh, tell us uh, because it is socialism with Chinese characteristics, um, what um, makes it so at this present time? Because it seems very much capitalist in many many ways. Secondly, I would I just one a last question would be would you say that China has imperialist ambition um, as it relates to the continent of Africa and um, not just Africa but uh, develop developing countries where uh, there is uh, loans um, extended to these countries to build infrastructure within these contexts um, many of which will not be able many of these countries will not be able to even uh, meet the interest payments. And so um, within that context, would you say that there is certainly some um, uh, imperialist leanings uh, by China? 
Thank you. Thank you, Manzaya. Beck, your mic is open. Uh, Beck, please open your mic. There you go. Hi. Um, so I kind of wanted to talk, ask about, um, I have heard from other like, comrades that there's been sort of a narrative about the COVID response as being sort of authoritarian or overblown and repressive, not only among, um, you know, the usual, um, like Western media propaganda, but among comrades and people who usually wouldn't believe that sort of thing. And um, that's something that people are still talking about a lot, particularly since a lot of, um, you know, things are opening back up. So I guess I'm just curious about your take on that, because personally, everything that I know about the COVID response seems to have been um, a good policy and something that I wish had been implemented more here and in other places. Um, but obviously, I mean, I haven't been there on the ground. So I guess I'm just curious because I've seen people that I respect in other areas talking about um, uh, Chinese policy be sort of in line with those um, Western media narratives. I guess I was just wondering if you could speak on that. Thank you, Beck. And last question, uh, Ismael, or Ismael, your mic is open. Please, there you yes. go. Th thank you for the presentation, both historical and the update. Uh, I'd like to know if you can recommend some sources uh, online to read. Uh, that would give us uh, a more uh, uh, truthful or honest opinion, uh, honest perspective of what uh, the Chinese people are reading and what uh, what we can count on more than the uh, the bourgeois press in this country. Thank you, thank you all. We appreciate your participation in the discussion, and I'll turn it over back to Duncan and Emily. Well, Emily, I think you were in China during the COVID period. Is that, is that I was true? in China. Uh, yeah, I I went to China in 2022, early 2022. So I think I experienced the latter part of it. The earlier part of it in China, well, that was actually pretty uneventful, save for the earlier chaos, uh, because it's facing an entirely new thing. Most of China, at least before mid, even before mid 2022, were almost 100% on board with the policies because most of them didn't even get touched by the earlier variants of COVID. And as far as I know, because I have family members in China, I have friends in China, they have zero complaints about it in the earlier part of the pandemic. Later, when Omicron and the later and the newer variants are being are rampant and the kind of measures are not like very effective people start to sort of complain and by the end of 2022 there even had been like a very measle uh, uh very measly attempt at cover color revolution because of it and you know i happen to have a friend on the ground it was a mess but nothing in particular really happened so the response in China is, if you actually have a chance to look at it, it's actually pretty fascinating. So for the for, for last year, when I am here and experiencing the whole thing, I, I saw that as a collective societal uh, effort of all people from the most local of the communities to you know higher ups. Uh, there are some you know, hiccups here and there, but what I see is volunteers on the ground, you know, people, uh, mostly willing to do all the tests and people wanting to keep them self healthy uh, it is very important for them because you know the kind of tradition of hygiene movement and you know epidemic prevention is deep rooted in chinese people's hearts so from what i see it isn't as the western media claim at all there are there were difficulties uh, there were you know uh, hiccups when you know policies changes but most most of most of the time, it, people are pretty on board with it. And right now, uh, for this year, you know, China is being opened up. You know, y'all can apply for travel visas now. 
uh, if you want to. Uh, people get cold, get you know Omicron now and then. Uh, there were a wave in in January, and uh, in last December and January, I got that one. There, I, I feel like there is a current wave, but it's not very that big. China is steadily rolling up Omicron specific variant of uh, 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 of the um, of the vaccines. I'm planning on getting it. So yeah, it, so rest assured, it is a pretty fascinating people's effort to combat the uh, the pandemic. And I will welcome you to learn uh, to, to learn about it. It's pretty fascinating to see how this kind of societal effort happens on the ground and with a lot of CDC cadres needing it as well. So I also wanted to spend, uh, sorry for taking up a big chunk of time describing that. And I might also take a chunk of time to describe the, the question on whether China is imperialist or not. So, so one thing is that painting the other world powers as imperialist is a powerful imperialist propaganda. And that as that makes the leftists in the imperial core withdraw from showing moral solidarity to the other party in the conflict. And in result, that will support their own imperialist home country through inaction. But I will uh, explain about the whole imperialism and debt trap in a little bit more detail, and I will provide some links to it. Uh, so uh, with Lenin's definition that we have, uh, imperialism is the highest form of capitalism. And what is the highest form of capitalism today? It is not real economy. It is not. It is financial capitalism that is the highest form of capitalism today, in which a country has financial control of the entire world through its currency. Therefore, by man manipulating their own finance, combining with instigation of conflicts and blockades, the imperialist country can make capital come and go from any parts of the world, gaining massive super profits in the process without doing the hard work of industrializing or investing. So this is how the United States, our own country, have been gaining super profits over the last few decades. Is China at that stage of capitalism? Can China do that? No, China cannot. Moreover, as the biggest manufacturer in the world, China couldn't even benefit from that kind of imperialism because China benefits from real economy and trade. And the peaceful and, and, and prosperous global environment in which everyone can trade in real economy is endlessly more beneficial than a world in which imperialism can best gain super profits. So yeah, not only is China not imperialist, its interest lies in direct opposite to imperialism. Then what about the debts? What about China you know, loaning money to uh, developing countries? Well, the whole debt trap narrative is a lie fabricated in 2017 and 2018 and promoted by the US State Department. Prior to that, when you search debt trap, you cannot find anything about China at all. In order to smear, that is dis distributed in order to smear the Belt and Road Initiative. In fact, um, China's loans constitute of all of those uh, countries that are in debt trap, China's debt constitute only about like 10 to 20 percent. Most of the debts that the, those countries hold are from Western uh, private institutions. So I did a podcast with our comrades on the International Department YouTube channel on this particular topic. Go look at it. I, I talk about it like in much detail. So yeah. And well, uh, Duncan, do you have anything other to say? Sources <clears throat> and stuff. Well, a lot of these are big discussions, and, and I, I welcome yeah. these the big questions. And and uh, to that point, uh, I, I would encourage people uh, to um, uh, stay alert. The International Department is in the process of. It's held and is organizing a series of discussions on China. And um, I think it'll enable us to go into some of these points more. And also the international conference, which I believe is being held by the party on July 29th, will discuss mm -hmm. you know, questions of imperialism mm -hmm. and so forth. Um, but I would just briefly, very sketchy comments, um, you know, you can talk about the expansion of capitalism in the 1980s, um, bringing in uh, foreign direct investment from capitalist countries and so forth. Um, certainly that, that happened, but I think the word capitulation is completely incorrect. Uh, um, 
people look at that, but they don't look at the four cardinal principles, which were maintained uh, during that same period, which uh, Emily uh, mentioned, one of which is stay to the socialist road. So what socialist road, in my view, involves a planned economy. There was a planned economy during those in, uh, 1980s and 1990s, which was primary and you can check out the five-year plans and you can check out the results of the five-year plans and you can see even during that period that planning mechanism by the socialist state was operating um, very well um you know as, as far as characterizing china i mean i th um you know china um china can characterize itself um Socialism and Chinese characteristics. Well, one question I would I would ask people is, what is the condition of the working class in China? Um, I, I think that um, if you study that question, I think even most capitalists at this point would agree that there's been a tremendous elevation of both the living standards and the um, cultural. Um, uh, availability um, to most of the working class in China. It, it's the, 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 the that the Chinese working class is much better off today. The, the great majority, uh, I think, is kind of an uncontested um, uh, set of facts, in my opinion. And uh, you know, 800 million, 800 World Bank says 850 million people were lifted out of poverty. To me, that's a socialist program. Uh, yeah, I would just add in terms of um, what Emily says, that China, China is, a, is a champion of a multipolar world. And if you want some information about the uh, uh, incorrect ideas about the debt trap in Africa, there's a tremendous amount of research has been done by an author named Deborah Bradigan, B-R-A-U-T-I-G-A-M, who's with Johns, Johns Hopkins Research Institute, who has studied um, Chinese loans to Africa in great detail. And bottom line is Ch Chinese terms in general are actually much better than what are granted by uh, the Western capitalist countries and Western banks. Um, so it, it's really important. It's absolutely and crucial to study. If you want to know what's going on in China, you got to study Chinese sources. You can, um, you know, I could almost just say, if all you do is read Western sources, you you don't know what's going on in China. There's a tremendous propaganda war going on, and there are. Um, you know, one fabrication um, after the other is, is being concocted by the U.S. ruling class. Um, so you need to study. I study both Western and and the Chinese press. Um, very different accounts of the same events. Um, take a you know, look at them both. One good source is um, I would recommend is Dongsheng News, D-O-N-G-S-H-E-N-G. -E uh, they've got a lot of good, uh, you can search for that, they've got a lot of good information about China. Thanks. Okay, well, thank you both. Um, unless you have any final comments, uh, we will close this webinar for today. Um, our next uh, Marxist class, national school class, is on Saturday at 11 a.m. Uh, Eastern Standard Time. And we look forward to seeing everyone at that. For now, uh, thank you all. This this class is adjourned. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. Thank you for coming.